If you were given one hour to capture the best astro image that you could of an object, what exposure length would you choose? And why would you choose that? Would you take one single one hour long exposure? Would you take 61 minute exposures? Or would you take 240 15 second exposures? Why am I asking this and why does it matter? Well, tonight, I'm putting it to the test and we're going to be testing long versus short sub exposures to find out what is the best sub exposure length? Does it matter? Can you take good astro photos with really short sub exposures? Or do you really need those long exposure times? This video is going to be broken down into three different parts and each of those will be linked down below so you can jump around and listen to the parts that you're most interested in. To start off, we're going to be going over an exposure length cheat sheet that'll give you some good approximations for different exposure lengths depending on whether you are in the city or out in the middle of nowhere and no matter whether you're using a one-shot color camera or an ultra narrow band filter. Then we will go into some tests and work out doesn't matter if you take really short exposures and lots of them or should you be taking just a few long exposures. Then we're going to have a bit of a deep dive into the science behind what exposure lengths are best and what is best for your gear and your specific location. Now when I started astrophotography I was chasing really long subs and that was really tough because at the time I didn't have a guide scope or a guide camera. I had a mount that was just tracking the stars and it didn't know whether it was tracking well or not. And it was really tough for me to get exposures over about 15 or 20 seconds and I felt like that was holding me back. And so I went out and got a lot of gear to improve my guiding situation. And now I can find it's quite easy to take exposures well up to 10 minutes if I want to. But is that really necessary and does it hold back new astrophotographers in the field? Well, you may be surprised in this cheat sheet because a lot of the exposure lengths may be shorter than you're expecting. So let's dive into the exposure length cheat sheet and then we can go over why these exposure lengths are the length that they are and if that's right for you or if you should be striving for those ultra long exposure times. So a few caveats before we jump into the cheat sheet. Firstly, this is assuming that you are using a modern CMOS sensor, something made by ZWO, QHY, maybe in the last three or so years. Secondly, it's gonna assume that you have a telescope between F4 and F7. If your telescope is vastly outside of these f-stops, then you will need to adjust your exposure time to compensate for the fact that your telescope is faster or slower. Thirdly, this assumes that you will want to take at least 20 subframes. Now, we'll talk more about that in a moment, but keep that in mind when you're looking at this. Finally, you want to be aware of overexposure because some of the sublengths do get long, but you want to make sure that you're not Exposing, exposing your sensor for so long that your stars start clipping. And once again, if you're interested in more of these details, hang around after because we will be doing a deeper dive into what all of this means. So over here, we have our first cheat sheet. This is designed for one-shot color cameras, monochrome cameras with red, green, or blue filters, or if you're doing a monochrome luminance. Now, as you can see here, a lot of these exposure lengths are actually quite short. For inner city, we have 30 seconds for one shot color or RGB monos and 20 seconds for luminance layers. If you're in a urban area, maybe you're around a bottle four to six, then you can bump that up to about 60 seconds for RGB or one shot color cameras and 40 seconds for luminance. And if you're under some really pristine dark skies, then you would be able to expose for 90 or more seconds for your red, green and blue or for about 60 or more seconds for your luminance. And why do I say 60 or more here? Well, it's because you can expose for longer, but it's not necessarily recommended. And if you're traveling to a dark sky for the first time, then I would recommend you sticking to this 90 and 60 seconds, because that will be a great baseline for you. And only push things further once you understand what the benefits and cons of taking ultra long exposures are. So now that we've looked at our red, green, and blue and luminance layers, let's jump over to some narrow band. And in this chart, we're now gonna break things down into how narrow band your filters are. So here we have 12 nanometers, seven nanometers, and three nanometers. 
which are some very common narrowband filter transmission lengths. If you have a filter that's in between one of these stops, then simply take an in-between number and it should give you a good idea of where to start. Once again, this is broken into inner city, urban and rural areas. And you'll notice that as the transmission width of your filters decreases, the exposure length is gonna go up and that's because less light is coming through to your camera sensor. So you're gonna to wanna to expose for longer to make sure you're exposing correctly. So if you're in an inner city environment, then between 60 and 120 seconds, depending on your filter width, will expose nicely for you. If you are in an urban environment, then you may want to increase that from 120 seconds to 240 seconds. And if you're under some nice rural skies, then you will want to take 240 seconds or more. And that's it, that is the cheat sheet. But why are we choosing these exposure times? Can you really expect a good image from a 20 second luminance layer? Why are some of these numbers so short and why are some of them so incredibly long? Well, let's jump into a test to find out why we have these numbers that we have and will they work for you? So when I asked earlier if you had one hour to take the best astro image that you could, how long was the exposure length that you chose? Last night, I did a test. I gave myself 15 minutes to take the best astro image I could. In that 15 minutes, I took two different exposure lengths. I took 15 minutes of 15 second sub-exposures. So it was 60 images at 15 seconds each. I then took another 15 minutes of photos, but this time at three minute exposures. That was five three minute exposures. And I stack them. These photos have had the exact same treatment. They've been calibrated with darks. They have not been calibrated with flats. And they have simply been stacked together using PixInsight's weighted batch pre-processing script. So let's put up a side by side and let's see if you can guess which is the 15 second exposure and which is the 180 second exposure. I'll give you a few seconds to guess. And here's the results. Were you surprised? Did you guess correctly? So let's have a look at some of the deeper details of these images and work out what is the difference between five three minute exposures and 60 15 second exposures. Firstly, I think from my perspective, the most interesting thing here is the differences are very subtle. And the main takeaway if you are starting astrophotography is that you do not need exceptionally long exposure times to take good images. You can start out taking really short images. You could take five second images if that's all you're able to get. And if you can stack enough of them, then you can get an image that is quite comparable to those that are out there taking multi-minute exposures. But let's dive deeper because there are some differences between these images that are worth exploring further. So let's start by having a look at the 15 second exposure images and talk about where this image looks better than the three minute exposure images. Firstly, if we take a really close look at these two images side by side, you may notice that the 15 second image actually looks sharper. The details are a bit crisper and the stars are smaller and sharper. Now this is because a shorter exposure length image has less time for negative effects like wind, atmospheric seeing, flexing within your telescope to cause a detrimental effect to your image. So while each of the images capture less light, they will capture a more accurate representation of the light that they had at that time. This means that when you're looking at the details of the image, the 15 second image may actually look nicer. Secondly, and this is a really big point, if you have bad exposures, but you're taking short exposures, then if you have to throw out a couple of those exposures because maybe a cloud came over your object for a couple of seconds, or the wind blew really strong and you had a little bit of trailing during an image, then it doesn't cost you very much. You can simply remove that exposure or two and you've only maybe lost 30 to 60 seconds worth of exposure time. However, if you are taking really long exposures and you lose one image, then you lose minutes worth of exposure time. And that can really start to cost you over a night. 
Unfortunately, that's where the goodness of the 15 second image ends. The 180 second does have some benefits though, so let's have a look at those. Firstly, if we take a really close look at the shadow regions, you will notice that the 180 second has less obvious noise. That's because we had less subs in this stack. Every time you take a photo with your camera, there is a little bit of noise that gets added by the camera when it's reading out those pixels. Each time you read out those pixels, you add, you add a bit of noise to the image. So by adding less images to the stack, you are adding less read noise. So this is the main benefit of having long exposure times, is you add less camera read noise into your final image. So your background will be less noisy. Secondly, the faint nebulosity in this 180 second image is more detailed due to that lower noise floor. Because you are attracting more photons into the camera compared to the read noise and dark current of the camera, and that means that it can distinguish between really ultra faint nebulosity better than on those shorter exposures. Thirdly, having less subs means your processing goes faster and you take up less hard drive space. So now we know what the differences are between three minute exposures and 15 second exposures. And maybe you're surprised at how little difference there is, or maybe you're surprised at how much of a difference there is considering both of these images have 15 minutes of total exposure time. So really what we have here is a trade-off. Neither of these images are perfect. And that's because there's imperfections in the way that we capture images through read noise in the camera, and also imperfections in our tracking and the atmosphere that we have around the earth. And we have to balance these options together to work out what is the best compromise that we have that will give us the best final image. And usually, like all things, it sits in the middle. You don't wanna take ultra short exposures but you also don't want to risk taking ultra long exposures because throwing out one ultra long 20 minute exposure will do far more damage to your final image than taking multiple much shorter exposures. So to summarize, this all comes down to where your location is, what your gear capabilities are like, and what the night that you have is. If the location that you have has really dark, clear skies, then you are able to image longer. If there's no wind, then you're able to image longer. If your gear has excellent tracking and perfect guiding, then you're able to image longer. However, every time that you get a roadblock in any of those parts, you will want to shorten your sub exposure length to compensate. And that will mean that you will get a better image overall for the gear that you have. So you're probably now thinking, great, the answer is that I take the longest exposures that my gear and the weather will allow, right? Well, no. There is one final thing to consider, and that is how many images you have per object. In the test examples that I showed you earlier, there were no planes or satellites that went through this image. There was no pixel rejection, really, that had to happen. But if you're taking images, it is more than likely that at some stage, a satellite or a plane or a cloud will go through one of your subs. And then the software that you use to stack will have to work out, are those pixels meant to be there or not? And when it's doing this, it is best if you have at least 20 subs to go on. This way, the algorithms that the software uses will be best optimized to work out what pixels are meant to be in the image and what pixels are meant to be removed from the image because they're only in a couple of them. And if you have some slow moving satellites or planes that follow a same path and always go over similar pixels, then you will want even more than 20 so that the software can best differentiate between the planes and the nebulosity that you are trying to image. With that in mind, before you start imaging, calculate the total amount of time that you are going to be able to image this object because we all have limits. Perhaps there's a tree in your neighbor's yard, or perhaps you're only at the dark site for one night and you want to make sure that you're imaging while the object is above a certain altitude. Calculate that whole time, it may be three hours, and then work out how many channels of imaging you want. If you're using a one-shot color camera, then there will be one channel because you're recording red, green, and blue all together. So you get three hours of imaging time. But if you're using a monochrome with RGB filters, 
then you will have one hour per channel, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. And then within each of those channels, you want to make sure that you have at least 20 images. So in the monochrome one, you could have very, very long exposures because you would only need to fit 20 exposures into three hours. And at this stage, you would probably be limited by your gear and the weather. But if you are wanting to take the RGB in the monochrome, then you only have one hour per channel. So you'd be limited to five minute exposures per channel. Now that doesn't mean you should take five minute images per channel. Like we said earlier, this would depend on your gear and the weather and making sure you're not overexposing bright sections of your image. But this is the final thing for you to consider. So there you have it. Longer exposures will result in a slightly better image, but you have to weigh that up against the chance of losing one of those longer exposures compared to losing just a much shorter exposure. And always try and make sure that you have 20 or more total exposures so that your stacking software can, do the, can use the best algorithms possible to ensure that your pixel rejection is up to scratch. Now, if you're looking for a little bit more information, then there are two more topics that we can discuss for you to truly understand sub exposure lengths in their completeness. Firstly, there is maximum images. Now, maximum images are the maximum number of images that you will want to take per channel. Why would there be a maximum number of images? Surely you would always want more images than less images, but you will find that you will start running into two problems. Firstly, storage space. If you are taking thousands of images, then you are going to need terabytes of storage space depending on the file size of your camera. And this is something that you're going to need to take into consideration when you're out on the field, because we all have an upper limit to the amount of storage space that we have available. Secondly, processing time. If you are trying to process thousands or tens of thousands of ultra short exposures, then you can't expect it to be completed very quickly. And you will need to take an awful long time processing those images. Also, the chance of failure during a stack of many thousands of images starts to go up as your computer may start running out of RAM or there may be one error during an entire stack that causes you to lose that whole stack and start again. So I would recommend that if you are trying to take a lot of short exposures, that you keep the total number to a reasonable amount. But that will of course depend on the storage and the power of the computer that you are using. If you have a modern, very powerful computer, then you could definitely get away with one to 2000 images. But if you have a laptop that you are trying to run on things on, then I would limit it to a couple of hundred subs per channel. Finally, if you are still here, then you must be a diehard to understanding sub times. And the final thing that we're going to talk about today is minimum exposure time. The minimum exposure time is the minimum recommended exposure time that you should be taking your images at to not get more than a certain amount of extra noise over a perfect single sub of the same length. This is a very complicated topic and there are some speakers out there who have done some excellent work on this. So I will be leaning heavily on their research for this part. To calculate the minimum recommended exposure time for your gear, you will want this, C R squared over P, where C is a complex formula that determines how much extra noise are you okay with adding into your image for the benefits of having shorter sub length. Now, as we discussed earlier, the benefits of shorter sub length are that if you lose a sub, you only lose a short amount of exposure time. So in this regard, we can assume that 10 is a good number for C. 10 will mean that you are okay with adding 5% extra noise into your image for the benefit of having a reasonably short exposure length. If you would like to add less noise, then increase C. If you are exceptionally picky, C could end up being 20. Next up, we have R squared, and this is the read noise of your camera. And if you have a modern CMOS camera, then this may be between one and five. Now you'll see that this is squared, which means really you wanna get the lowest read noise that you can, because as it gets higher, the squaring of it will make it exponentially worse and you will want this to be as low as possible. The lower your camera's read noise, the less of a negative impact you have of adding lots of short exposures together. The higher the read noise, the more you are going to want to have longer exposures. Finally, we have P, 
and this is the light pollution that is in your area. The more light pollution you have, then the shorter you want your subs to be. The less light pollution you have, the longer you are going to want your subs to be because there is less of a noise floor for you to capture so you can expose for longer before that noise floor gets overridden by the read noise. Now this is the formula that I used to calculate the cheat sheet at the start of this video. So if you take this cheat sheet, if you take this formula and plug in numbers for your camera, including where C equals 10 or 20, depending how picky you are, R is the read noise of your camera at the gain that you choose. So in my case, the 294mm at 120 gain, which is a unity gain, is 1.7 for the read noise. Is 1.7 for the read noise. And then P is the light pollution. But once again, this is a little bit complicated. So to calculate P for the area that you are going to be imaging in, I would recommend you go to two of the links below. Firstly, you're going to want to pull up the light pollution map. Light pollution map is a map of the world that will show you the bottle level or sky brightness level of your area to a reasonable degree of accuracy. If you have some gear that measures the light pollution of your area on the night, then of course you can get much more accurate with this. Once you have that number in mind, for me in my home here, it's around 18 SQM. And then you want to go to tools.sharpcap.co.uk, add in these details and it will give you a result that you can then put into P. Now under the SharpCap tools, you will need a couple of extra bits of information. Firstly, you will need the QE of your camera and this can usually be found in the manufacturer's specifications. Cameras will also change their QE over the entire visible spectrum. So here you can just take an average. For the 294mm, you can use about 85% because it is quite sensitive. If you're using an older camera, like the 1600mm, then you may want to drop this to 50-60%. to 60%. Secondly, you're going to want to add in the pixel size of your camera. Once again, this can be found on the vendor specification list. For the 294mm, it is 4.6 in its bin 2 mode. So here is the formula for my camera, the 294 monochrome in my home looking up at the sky. And you can see here, these are some of the results that I have. And to reiterate, this is the minimum recommended. So what this means is if you have a sub exposure length shorter than this, you're gonna see more than a 5% increase in the read noise over a perfect exposure. So what I do is I take this and then I work out how many exposures I'm going to need in the night. And so long as the sub length that I get to get 20 exposures is longer than this, I know that my images are gonna turn out well. I hope you learned something from this video. And if you didn't, please leave a comment down below and let me know what it is you would like to learn about this topic or if there are other, other topics that you would like me to make videos on. My name is Rowan, this is Astro with Roro, and I hope you have clear skies.